I always knew I was going to be a writer because um, my father died when uh, I was six, and he was a writer, and he was also a preacher. He invented a religion called uh, the Infinite Plan, and um, he used to. I used to go and watch him preach, and he um, wrote a book also called the Infinite Plan, and he would get. This was during the Depression. So he would travel around and put up a tent in, in the Southwest. And he was an Australian himself. And he was in love with the cowboys and uh, with women and with booze and everything else. And it's kind of a mess. And uh, I used to watch him talk with an orange hanging from the ceiling. And he would say that that was the universe. And that um, if you just listened to him, he was going to allow you to go to heaven. And of course, his personal life was a mess. Uh, but he had a Mexican gal who was his lover. And his, um, she was in charge of the church, the money. And of course, when he died, um, we didn't have any money because she had it all. And my mother uh, was the mother of three kids. And so she took us to a place in East Los Angeles where she owned property. and. Uh, she put us in an apartment and then charged the county rent because we didn't have any money. She had it all. And so I grew up in East LA, and that's why I spoke Spanish or Spanglish, um, because um, uh, I had to run fast and talk Spanish. And um, I want to stay in East LA for, for a minute because it, it has something to do with why I became a mystery writer. On uh, the first day of school, um, I walked out of the gate of the school of where Paul used to teach, guys like me. And uh, there were five guys there waiting for me. And they wanted blood. So I ran to the church, which was right down the street. And I, they followed me there. And there, I kept yelling for God to help me. And God never showed up. And the priest never showed up. And they beat the crap out of me. So the next day, on my way uh, to school, I saw that there was a library between the school and me. And so I, um, when the bell rang, I ran to the library with the same five guys chasing me. And I'd never been in a library in my life. I was only six years old. I didn't know how to read. And um, so I started looking at books for kids and stuff. And uh, then I asked the librarian if she'd help me uh, get learn the alphabet, and she did. And during the next three or four months, uh, she taught me how to read. And um, so I started looking around the library, and I was very fascinated by the fact that the books seemed to have spirits. And uh, I, I was very interested in how the hell you got out of the ghetto. And so I would read uh, stories about Daniel Webster and George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and stuff like that and then but the next year my when I was in the second grade I started shining shoes downtown LA and on on Main Street where all the winos go why did I choose the, that because that's where I saw the people there I didn't know anything about money or anything and so um, and on the streetcar going to downtown the dime novel which was then in fashion, was all the mysteries that you could buy for a dime. And they were scattered around the um, streetcar. So I would pick them up and put them in my shine box that I, by the way, had made myself. And so I, was, I would go down, shine shoes on Main Street, and make a dollar. And then uh, one of the winos told me that uh, I was obviously poor or I wouldn't be there. So why didn't I go up to uh, Clifton's Cafeteria on 7th and Broadway and um, I could get a free meal because they took care of poor people. And this was just after the war and uh, the Depression was pretty much still on. So I went over there and I got a free meal and I saw that they had a wishing wells all over the place. So I came back in the afternoon, well, that afternoon, but actually I, he told me to go up to Pershing Square because if I was on that side of town, I could charge more money for uh, my shines, and I would 
could get 25 cents instead of a dime. So I went up there, but I didn't feel comfortable uh, because it was, I didn't belong on that side of town. I belonged in, on the east side. So then I went back to Clifton's because I saw this thing about the wishing well. And so I went in there and I grabbed a handful of coins and I put them in my pocket and I walked out of the, the um, cafeteria and it looked like I had peed all the way down, but I got 20 more cents. And so I would do this every Saturday. I would go in there after I'd made my dollar uh, on uh, Main Street with the winos. I would go on to Clifton's and I would get food and then I would steal some more money from the, from the um, um, wishing well. Well, but the point of the reason I'm telling you that story is that I started reading these dime novels of, uh, of the time and the one of, although this was a surprise to most people, one of the most interesting uh, writers was Earl Stanley Gardner, who was himself a lawyer. Um, and he wrote, I liked the way he wrote. And um, so I, I always appreciated him. He wrote like 200 books under five or six different names. And it was a really interesting guy. And there was a lot of other people, Raymond Chandler, all those other guys. But, um, and Dashiell Hammett, who was supposed to be the best of all of them. But I loved uh, Earl Stanley Gardner. So, um, but I, I lived in the ghetto. I had to get out of there and education was a way to do it. And so when I um, got into high school, um, I um, finally um, uh, did well and I graduated with honors and I went to Berkeley. And I still was gonna be a, a lawyer and a writer. I always wanted to do that and I, I, I went on and I did that. And, uh, but I knew I would never write a book until I was 60. So that's when I hitchhiked around the world and um, did all the other stuff, went to law school, uh, and then I started representing Latinos in, uh, in their daily uh, fight against uh, the system. And I did that for a long time, oh, 50 years, as a matter of fact. So when I was, when I was 60, I decided I was going to uh, start writing, and I did. And the, the interesting thing about that was that um, I remember my father preaching to the audiences. He was a very charismatic guy, very handsome, and he wore a tuxedo all the time. And um, so I said to myself when I became a lawyer, if I can get my story straight and talk, only talk for a half an hour, I can get the juries to give these people money but I won't talk for two hours like my father did. So you don't have to worry. I'm, I'm not going to talk for two hours. I learned my lesson. And the interesting thing is that I, all the years I was uh, practicing law and I was in before the juries, that's what I learned. And I, and I got my stories. I worked them and I worked them. And I always had a little surprise at the end. And um, the juries, I don't know if they loved me, but they helped my clients, which was was all about. And... Um, then I also, uh, as a young man, uh, aside from reading mysteries, um, I read Somerset Mom. And this fit right in with my idea about storytelling because he was a, one of the great short storytellers of all time. And at the end of every short story, he had a twist. And I just loved that. And I still, if you read my books, I mean, when you read my books, excuse me, <laughs> you'll find that at the end there's always a, a twist, and that's what I'm happy about. So when I, I started, I wrote my book, I wrote a 700-page book when I was um, 60, and I <clears throat> was then I was married to Isabel Allende, who was a very famous writer, and she read the book, and she said, that's a bunch of shit. <laughs> she said, no woman in her right mind is going to read that book because you have this oversexed dwarf in there. And women do not like to go to bed with oversexed dwarfs. So she said, why don't you write mysteries? You know a lot about forensics and stuff. And it's true. So, that, so then I started writing mysteries, and I wrote The Chinese Jars, and then I wrote um, uh, King of the Bottom, and um, then I wrote The Ugly Dwarf. Now, The Ugly Dwarf is really a story about my father. 
because, and I knew that I knew I couldn't let him go. And I, there's a dominatrix in there, and the dominatrix is was his lover. And um, I fashioned the dwarf after my father because he emotionally he was a dwarf. And I fashioned the dominatrix after my father's lover, this Mexican woman who was she was a, a witch, and she but she was a curandera, if you know what that means. And um, so, uh, and when I finished the book, people would come up to me and they'd say, boy, was that fantastic. She was just so wonderful. I've never met a more interesting character. I said, no, you can't like her. That, I was revenge. I was getting revenge. And at the end of the, I mean, she seriously, she went to jail for black magic. So, um, but I, and I, so I learned something about myself from writing that book. And uh, it, it was that she was an important person in my life because she taught me how to get along in the, in the ghetto. And she taught me how to be tough and how to be smart and how to stay alive. That's it. But you know, the interesting thing is that I, I have had Horatio's gone all over the world with me. And everywhere, I always ask if the, everybody wants to, anybody wants to see the dwarf. Do, anybody here? Everybody? Yeah? Stand up, Horatio. Stand up. Come on, stand up. Just stand up. This is the dwarf. It's, 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 Your honor. Your honor. So the, the, the second book I wrote was called King of the Bottom. And you might be interested to know how, where I got the title. Um, well, let, the first book, Chinese Jars, um, came, I got a, it was an article I read in the New York Times more than 50 years ago um, about um, a guy who lived in the sewers of New York and came out at night and he dressed in a tuxedo with an invitation in his pocket that he stolen from the garbage can of a, um, of a engraving place. And so that was, and he collapsed on the sidewalk and went to the hospital and he died of bleeding ulcers. And they couldn't think, figure out where he lived so that he lived in the sewer. And he would climb out of the sewer every night. And dress. So that's how, um, that's how I started that story. The King of the Bottom, the second one, um, I started because um, I, this guy um, Hitchens, the famous English guy um, what, had written a, uh, a review of Isabel Allende's first book, The House of the Spirits, in English. And um, it was 25 years uh, since that book had been written. And he wanted to, he was sent by uh, the English publication to um, review or get a, an update on her, how she was doing and stuff. And so he came to our house in, um, in San Rafael. And the day before, I had read a, an article in the Chronicle that's saying that um, three entrepreneurs wanted to um, build condominiums in um, Point Mulate. And, but in order to do that, they had to dig three gigantic 50-foot uh, wells or holes in the ground with a fan at the bottom to um, Turn it at which they had to turn on and then get rid of the poison because the land was so contaminated that it wouldn't work otherwise. And then I thought, well, Jesus, if that stuff goes in the air and the wind's blowing <coughs> towards my house, I get it. And what about all the other people? So it's absolutely ridiculous. So anyway, then Christopher Hitchens comes. And um, so then. I don't know why I started talking about this, but I started talking about um, what I'd read. And so his wife, uh, who he was a drunk, but she was a nice gal. <clears throat> and um, so she started telling me that in, in um, Los Angeles, the um, toxic dumps were all owned by Armenians. And then I thought immediately of uh, the incident that happened in Los Angeles several years ago when the Kurdish 
uh, I mean, the um, Turkish um, consul general walked out of his house and was shot dead by an Armenian teenager. So then one thing led to another, and I wrote that book, and it's about three or four Mexican guys who are accused of killing the um, Armenian owner of the toxic dump. And so uh, that's how that goes. But the title of the, of, of the book is really interesting because it's called King of the Bottom. And the idea is that the Armenian was the king of the bottom because he came from uh, Armenia and he was uh, working hard and he was down there with everybody else and he was the king and they were the slaves, you know. But the, uh, the title of the article was uh, about the blacks and the Mexicans that were having a fight for who was going to control the shoe shine trade in Palm Springs. And I, so I thought it was a, a, a great title, so that's what I used it. Um, then the fourth book, uh, after the, the, the Ugly Dwarf and Horacio, when I got tired of Horacio, I went on to something else. In 1960, when I went um, through the Middle East, I saw the disparity between the um, Palestinians and the, and the Jews, and I was very uh, impacted by that and how it was pretty unfair then, but it's gotten measurably worse since then. And um, th I, I noticed uh, how unfair it was, and I kept reading about it and reading about it. And then a friend of mine who uh, uh, lived in Hungary was there during the war, and he survived. He was a Jewish guy, and he and his brother survived in the basements of all the bombed out buildings in uh, 1944. And his mother and father were both taken to concentration camps, and his father died there, and his mother survived. And so I used um, his story. And um, I also met a friend uh, from Palestine who lived in um, Syria, and he gave me the other half of the story, so I told that. So then, we only got two more, be patient. <laughs> then the next one um, had to do w with um, <coughs> corruption in San Francisco. And um, I liked that one, because I was a lawyer for so long, and I took all this crap from the judges all the time, and I was fed up, so I wrote that book. And then the last one, the one that I had just uh, finished, really was based on a, um, a love story that I started in, in my first book with the, with the oversex dwarf. I also had a, a story in there about um, a French girl whom everybody wanted to know whether she was my lover or not, and I, and I said, no, I, it wasn't, I just, I don't know, she came to me as an as a image, and I wrote about her. And um, so then uh, I consulted my ex-wife again, and she said, you can't make that a love story now, because um, you have to have some crimes. So I throw in the kidnappings and the murders and all that sort of crap that you're doing. And, um, so that's how I, that's basically a rundown of uh, uh, my books and all of them are a part of me and um, uh, they are also in Spanish back there if anybody's interested. And um, now I open it up to questions and I have no shame, so just keep asking me. No question, come on. This is the best part of the show. <clears throat> Are you starting a new one now? I'm writing short stories. Short stories? Yeah. And are they crime? Well, some of them are, for instance, I wrote one about um, I Dream of Zombies. It's about the, um, the dominatrix goes to jail for black magic. And then after she comes, and while she's in jail, she writes an epistle about how to uh, create zombies. And she writes it on sheets of toilet paper. 
and she has a thousand sheets of toilet paper. And um, so when she comes out, she starts to put this plan into action. And um, I'm sorry, you have to read the story. That's as much as I'm going to read. <laughs> then there's the second one. Uh, one of the second short stories is about um, there's, a, there's a black guy who's a pimp in um, the um, book number five called The Halls of Power. And uh, he's a really smart guy. And he, he runs this little house over there in Emeryville. And uh, he, he helps uh, Samuel Hamilton, my detective, who's not a det detective, he's a reporter, uh, catch the murderer. Uh, and so um, after um, book number five, he calls Samuel up and says, listen, one of my girl's uh, daughter has been kidnapped. And I want to save her. And, of course, the daughter that's been kidnapped is actually his daughter with this girl. And so Samuel helps him. Uh, and you have to wait and read the story. That's all I can tell you. And the third one is about the wishing well that I sort of described to you. And you have to, if you really want to find out what happened there, you have to. I'm sorry, you guys. I gotta make a living. <laughs> yeah. Who was the, the name of the, my, the original Melba that we met with the, uh, the bar? Melba. 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 Yeah. Was she alive? No, she died a long time ago. The daughter? Uh, I don't know that daughter. I have her, the daughter's name in the right. in this book is Blanche, but that's not. Yeah. She's yeah. not even. Twenty second and Cap Coral Tie. 22nd and Cap, and um, I moved it up to, to Knob Hill because I, I wanted to give it a little class, you know. And I also wanted a view of the bay. Yeah. What so, happened to your mother? My How mother? Your father was having such an exciting life. What was your mother she, doing? She died. But did she ever remarry? Did oh, no. She, she um, you know, my mother, it's a very interesting story. My mother was a very well-educated person. She um, graduated first in her class from Drexel University as a um, chemist and a pharmacist in 1920. And she was the valedictorian of her class. But um, she was, my, when my father died, she was very depressed. And um, I almost think she was autistic, frankly. She, she just never got... You know, she never got over it. I don't know. And I mean, who, you know. But uh, she was a very cultured person. And I would say part of, part of my culture, haha, uh, comes from her. So would, would you tell us about Melba's and the characters? Would, did, were you just a bar owner? You didn't hang out there? Or were you? Well, 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 Melba, I, um, I, I would work for the Bocardo firm, and I represented seamen. And um, one of them was a Cuban guy who, uh, I, and I, you should never do this, but I loaned him 6000 bucks so he could buy a bar. And in those days, 6000 bucks. So. so he bought this bar, and then uh, he started pushing drugs in there and everything, and then he tried to sell the bar and go away, but I, I had the documentation that it was mine, and so the ABC let me take it over. And then I, knew, I had to have somebody that would, that would run it. And so they finally said, okay, you can, we'll transfer the license to you. Of course, I had George Agnos, the city attorney, uh, helping me, which didn't hurt. So, um, <clears throat> So I needed to have somebody that uh, would do the job. And Melba was a old, sort of a worn out waitress who um, um, was a friend of, uh, of uh, one of my partners. And so he put us together. And I sat down with her. And I said, OK, Melba, 
you can have the bar. You're, but we're partners, and all I want is 500 bucks a month. And you can do whatever you want with the rest of the money. So uh, for 25 years, it was the best investment I ever made. 500 bucks a month for 25 years. And then when she died, I, we sold it. And uh, I mean, when she, actually, when she wanted to retire, we sold it. And I think we split another 25,000 bucks. So it was a... And then, and then the characters were, what can I tell you? They were a mess. <laughs> they were a lot of Irish, worn out Irish, a lot of old people, drunks. There was a, also a lot of um, trans, transgenders would come in there. And I used one in the dwarf. And the guy was almost the size of the dwarf. And... Uh, he used to come in dressed as a woman, and I used him as a character in the in the, the dwarf. Uh, remember Finocchio's? That comes out there, and, and uh, so you know the, the the thing that's really nice about this is that all of this is San Francisco in the '60s, and it's all based on my memories. And once in a while, I have to go to a book, but I mean, it's pretty much. Uh, just based on my memory of what was going on then. Why did I wait till I was 60? What was the magic number? Well, the, the, um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I just was very hyperactive. Uh, and um, I, I, just, I, had, I just knew I was going to be 60. And that's what happened. I, I, I just couldn't do it before. I was too hyper and I was too... Huh. Do you think it's more difficult? No, it's difficult. Yeah. It's di the question was... Could people ask questions? Please speak into the mic. Oh. Did everyone hear my question? Yeah. You didn't? Yeah. That way we get it out quickly. Oh, okay. Um, I had heard that uh, writing short stories was the toughest thing to write yeah. that you can do. Do you feel that it's been dif more difficult for you than writing your novels? Yes, but it's more fun. Uh, you get... The secret to the short story is that you're, you're sort of like an archer. You take the bow and you, and you have one shot, and it goes and hits the target or it doesn't. And you have to describe uh, every person that you uh, use in the, in the short story, you have to describe them, and they have to have a purpose. You can't just, they just can't be, uh, you know, willy-nilly. They have to be... They have to have a purpose, and they, so you have to, yeah, it's, it's really tough. But it's, it's a lot of fun, especially after, you know, I wrote, I've written six books, and I was kind of tired of doing that, so. And I'm really having a good time. Yeah. I have two questions, Willie. Do you want to take one at a time? Sure. First question is, and I think I've heard your answer before, but it's worthwhile. Why is your main protagonist a reporter instead of an attorney? Very good question. I, uh, since I used to pick these books up from the streetcar and I got very, and I saw all this stuff and I got very tired of having the cuff guy knock down the door and, uh, you know, Earl Stanley Gardner said, um, um, he always got to give him six shots when there's a gunfight because uh, that's when uh, then you because you get paid by the page you see and so you, know, you take the six shots and then you're you know so so here I just got tired of that and I so I wanted to have a, a guy um, who number one couldn't do stuff on him by himself that he needed the help of all the, of other people s surrounding him. And uh, I didn't want him to be a cop for that reason. And I also, um, and as Cora said, you know, in noir, there's, you know, they're not cops anyway. No, they shouldn't be. And in Mexico, for instance, you can't, uh, nobody will read, them, read the mysteries if you make them a cop. 
because they don't trust the cops. <laughs> you know? So, so, um, but I needed, I needed it for another reason. I needed to have them, uh, I needed the help. I mean, for instance, Melba. This guy was a, he started out as a drunk and he hit somebody. Uh, in fact, he hit the, the girl on a bicycle, who, which was Emma, in, in, in the last book, who he injured very badly. And um, then um, he helped her uh, because he had injured her. And so then he ends up solving her uh, son's d uh, kidnapping. But, so, and then he, uh, the police people that he uh, gets hooked up with, like Bernardi and stuff, and stuff like that, they always help him. So, so you get to develop other characters and you just start having this one tough guy who all he has to, to show for is the fact that he can knock down a door and shoot people six times. So, so that's, why I, that's why I did it. So the second question is, have you or will you write a story that is based in a Latin American country? A Latin American country. Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I, I get close. Uh, I like to do the, I like to have, get characters from places rather than, and, and I like to have a, a mixture of people. And I like to have the, the ethnic part I like very much. And uh, I know a lot about uh, Latin culture and that. I'll probably get pretty close to that, at least having, I have a lot of uh, Latin characters in my books anyway. And when you write your stories, do you dream of it? Or how does it kind of come to you? How does it evolve? <clears throat> well, to tell you the truth, I was listening to Stephen King the other day, and I'm not comparing myself to Stephen King, but we all seem to do this the same way. So, something will happen. And um, I, I'm going to give you an example of, uh, of, of something like that. <coughs> I just, I have a friend in Ensenada who I went down there and I uh, used to give speeches there and I bring my, I have to bring my own books because uh, in Mexico there's only 500 bookstores in the whole country. And in Buenos Aires there are 500 bookstores in just the city. So it's kind of tough, and so I would bring the books myself. And this guy was—he was a garbage man, if you want a rural thing. But he made like two or three million dollars a month just picking up the recycling stuff from from the street. And uh, <clears throat> I couldn't believe the amount of money that he was making, and just in. In Sanab, but he was a very nice guy, and I liked him a lot. And he, po he spoke my kind of Spanish, which is it's the sp Spanish of the barrio. It's not the, the high class stuff that this guy speaks when he wants to. So um, he, the other day, I was talking to him uh, and uh, on the phone over um, Facebook and. Uh, he had quit uh, being a garbage man and sold his business. And then he came to work in the United States because he's also a US citizen. And then he didn't like that, so he went back and he, he started working as a, for Hyundai, the art car maker. And then he said, you know, I'm really tired of this stuff. I love the smell of garbage, and I love the people. <laughs> uh, now, I mean, <coughs> that really impacted me. That's something I can use, <clears throat> and I will, because it's such, it's, it's such an unexpected statement from such an unexpected person. He's not doing it for the money. He's, and so you, you have a character there, see? And it'll, it'll show up. It'll show up. And there's a, it, it needs something else, and I, I don't know what the something else is, but that's how, that's how things happen. Uh, for instance, um, the book about uh, the fractured lives. The guy, the Jewish guy, tells me the story of, of his youth, 
And then the Palestinian guy tells me, I'm there with the Palestinian guy. And so I know what's going on. So I, I get the two things, and, you, and uh, it, it's very powerful. So then you have a story. And, uh, and I can't tell you, something happens un, totally unintended, and then you, you, it sticks in your head. And then you go from there, as long as you have a head. Can you can you tell us something about when when you were an attorney and the system when you were working in San Francisco and how that impacted your work? Well, uh, I, I actually um, the impact came from Los Angeles because I grew up with Mexican uh, people. I was very close to them, uh, and I I mean I it was during the war. My father had died. And even though it was a tough neighborhood, they gave me a place to be. And they're a very warm culture. I don't know how many of you know about that. But, and so they're, they're very, and so I missed them. When I went to college, um, and when I, when I was in uh, high school, I was elected the student body president. There was only 8% of, pop, of the population there was Mexican, but I couldn't even speak English. Uh, I spoke English with a Mexican accent. So I, I won this thing, and, and so it was a big deal. And I, I, I was very close to them. And, and when I went to college, there weren't any. Two guys that were on the football team, and that was it. So when I went to uh, law school, same thing. When I started practicing law, uh, one of my first jobs was to be a city attorney because I spoke Spanglish. I would get called to the front desk and I would handle the Mexican American uh, or the Me even the Mexican people who were having problems and I, I realized that how much I missed it. So and when I started practicing myself, I just because I spoke the language, I was attracted to the people and I you know, you, you never just start out and say, Okay, what's the problem? You always say, How's the family? you know, blah 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 blah. You have a wonderful time, you have a wonderful chat, and then you get into the stuff about their, what their problem is. So, so it's, a, it's a way of who you feel comfortable with. And I, I just always felt comfortable with them. It's not them, it's sort of where I come from. So I, I represented people who didn't speak English. I defended them in the courts, mostly in civil, because I didn't like I didn't want to be responsible for sending anybody to jail, so I didn't do the criminal part of it. But uh, yeah, I remember I'm reading these detective novels and forensic novels. So um, and I, uh, a lot of the stuff that you see in my books, like the uh, damage from the chemicals and stuff like that, those are people I saw in my work, uh, and. Uh, I also people falling off scaffold, people with terrible injuries, and you send people back to Mexico with money, which was a big deal, especially in the early days. It got a little tougher, uh, and at, toward the end. But I, if it's in the books, read the books, read the books, read the books. So you said you um, made San Francisco a character, always, and. Can you tell us how you translated the characteristics of San Francisco into a person? Well, it's, it's not that they're a person. It's just that they are a character. And you describe the city. You describe Chinatown. Let, let me give you a, the, perf the most perfect example I can tell you about San Francisco is one that I don't know how many people have thought about this. But if you go to New York and you want to have, have the smells of... Uh, the Chinese, the Dominicans, uh, the Filipinos, you have to go a long way in different directions. All you got to do is walk down Kearney Street where the Italians, the Filipinos, and the Chinese, and I don't know who else, all meet, and you can have all those smells right there. So you're just right at home in the, in the rest of the world right 
just by walking down the street. And it's such a wonderful feeling. And you can say, wow, wow. And you're, you start imagining. I mean, for instance, uh, in my first book, the Mr. Song is a Chinese albino. He's the, he's the herb guy. Well, I actually saw Mr. Song on the street. I saw, I wanted to have a, an herb shop and I wanted to, to be special. And one day I'm driving down the street on Kearney Street and I see an albino Chinese guy in a, in, in a suit. And I thought, geez, it's a gift, you know? Talk about, you know, the, the second part of what you need to study, you know? And so that's what happens. That's San Francisco. So you can't, you know, and San, Chinatown's a very appealing thing, but there are other parts. You know, if you, do you know the, where the Chinese funerals take, take place? They take place out of the Italian mortuary. And you know why that is? Because the Italians moved out, and the mortuary is not stupid. They want to make money, so they get the Chinese to come in there, and they have their funerals, and they do the thing. And the, and the band, the Chinese band that plays on the funerals, there's no Chinaman left because they didn't want to join the union. So it's all Italian. So, you know, you figure it out. But this is San Francisco. I mean, that's just a crazy city. And it's perfect for this stuff. Or it was. One, one of the things I really enjoyed is your descriptions of San Francisco. I can follow where you're going. And so when, when you were writing, did you go back and walk the streets and see, or is it all from memory? It's all from memory. I remember I worked here for 28 years. And, and, I mean, and the smells and the, the, what you see, what I saw then, when I was in college, we used to come to the Matador every Sunday and watch the bullfights. And of course, that's all gone. And, uh, you know, and before that, it was, uh, it was down, down below, the, that was the bad section. But then Mayor Christopher kicked all of the bums out, and then they moved up to, to Broadway. And, uh, and so, and, and then there was, and the gay culture was just getting started, and you could go up Grant Street, and you could have, there were gay bars and stuff. But they weren't legal, you know. But they were there, and uh, so all that stuff was just going on. Hi, Diana. How are you? That's my trainer. She beats the crap out of me once a week. Her name is Brutella. So. <clears throat> Are you going to be, go back to the series? You've been writing short stories. Well, right now go back I'm writing short stories, and I, I, you never know. I just go where, you know. I'm so happy to be, to be able to do this, that, especially at my age, you know. So it's really exciting. I've had a full career as a lawyer. I'm having a wonderful time as a, as a writer, and uh, now I'm writing short stories, and it's an adventure. And I, you know, Somerset Mom was such a great storyteller, and I, I'm not thinking I'm Somerset Mom, but I'm thinking, hey, I'm doing what one of my great idols did, you know, and uh, and having fun doing it. So that's it. Well, this is probably not, this. <laughs> let, let's wrap it up. Buy my books; they're back there. <laughs>